All right, all right. So let's jump straight into the deep of it. So we've seen quite a bit of momentum over the last couple of years post-COVID. We've seen commitment pledges for decarbonizing this industry until 2050. That requires, however, a massive drop until 2030 that we've yet to be seen. Uh, we've seen biodiversity uh, taking a center stage, finally, in the conversation with the uh, late 2022 coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. And last week, of course, many of you know, uh, this week, actually, we've seen the uh, treaty, the High Seas Treaty, which is probably key to achieving some of the Global Biodiversity Framework targets, including the 30% of uh, conservation of land and sea by 2030. Despite all of this, however, uh, Emission reduction are, are yet to be seen. We're not on track. We're also, we also have a work cut out on the biodiversity topic in our industry. We monetize nature. We know that. We rely on stable climate conditions. And the next two decades really will decide whether we can overcome that twin crisis of anthropogenic climate change and biodiversity degradation without major prosperity losses. You've all, many of you were at the opening reception uh, on Monday. You've heard the Vice Chancellor, German Vice Chancellor Robert Habeck, who rightly said the freedom to explore the world is no justification for its destruction. Um, so let's find out and turn to our opening keynote. Um, he is the Director Emeritus at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research which he founded more than 30 years ago and is now really a leading institute. Um, he's also the founder and managing director of Bauhaus Erde. He's been really ringing that climate emergency bell for years. Um, and more recently, he's been focusing on the potential of regenerative architecture uh, for the built environment, and something that hoteliers here in the house would be quite interesting when we look at nature-based solution for the built environment. We look forward to his keynote, and the title is can we preserve the world while enjoying it? Please welcome Professor John Schellenhuber. Hi, really. Yeah, good morning. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. So these are exciting times. We actually welcomed you two years ago in 2021. Yes. Uh, this was a different times almost because we were live streaming, but without an audience as we have today. Two years have gone by. It's almost a world that's different today. Uh, but many of the problems that we face are still uh, on our shoulders. And so we look forward to your keynote. The floor is yours. Okay. Thanks a lot, Billy. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here again, but with a live audience here. It's much nicer, actually, to see real faces and real human beings. Yeah, my, my title, as you can see, is about the dilemma, the fundamental dilemma tourism industry, tourism at large is facing. Namely, we want to go to places, ideally, to places nobody has seen before, actually, or you have only through the social media learned about that. But the problem is you may just consume the place or the site, the destination, the community you want to visit and when it's gone. So it's the permanent challenge of preserving and destroying things. Uh, and uh, with climate change, of course, and the biodiversity loss, uh, the panel really just uh, referred to we have a tremendous challenge and we have to face it in the next two decades, actually. But uh, I will tell you the blunt truth about the situation. But uh, don't despair, I will also talk about a solution. And it's actually an uh, astonishingly, uh, surprisingly simple solution, which is based on what nature is offering and evolution is offering us. So, you have saw the title and uh, this is what uh, tourism is all about. Uh, we want to go to beautiful places nature is offering us, and we want to go to beautiful cultural sites. So you have the Campanile in Venice here, and you have beautiful meadow here. And unfortunately, with climate change, with global change in general, more and more sites and destinations are threatened. So this is back in 2019. But one of the supreme tourist locations in the Bahamas was destroyed through a hurricane, Hurricane Dorian. 
But this is not just a problem for what we call the Global South, the Caribbean. Uh, so these are recent uh, pictures from New Zealand, which was always considered to be a safe place for tourism. Uh, we had devastating uh, floods. Uh, and this has to do with what is called uh, La Nina. Actually, we have this roller coaster dynamics in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you have an El Nino event, uh, unusual warming of the Eastern Pacific, and when you have a La Nina, it's a cool phase. And actually, according to our modeling, we will see starting a major El Nino event this year, and this will probably push global warming very close to the 1.5 degrees line already next year. So we depend very much on this natural variability, which is made much more severe by human interference with the climate system. So long time ago, actually more than 50 years ago, I'm a member of the Club of Rome. The whole consciousness, the whole awareness regarding resources, environment, more or less was triggered in 1972 by the Limits to Growth report to the Club of Rome. And you know, if you look to this, let me see whether this works. Yeah, it actually works. If you look at this original modeling uh, predicting a collapse of the global industrial system somewhere between 2020 and 2040, when you see it was all about resources. So in that scenario, people thought, well, we might actually be depleting all the major resources, including oil, for example, and coal and gas. Uh, and when there will be a sort of collapse. But look at this line here. This is just called pollution, not even explicitly CO2, greenhouse gases. Uh, it was just about environmental pollution. And the idea was that at that time, it's just a marginal thing. It will accompany more or less this resource depletion thing. And in the end, everything will collapse. But today we know it is this line that really matters. We will not run out of coal. We could still power our stations and produce power with coal for the next 300, 500 years, actually. But this would just destroy the atmosphere. So today we speak about so-called planetary boundaries. So. Uh, this was created, the notion, by my successor at the Potsdam Institute, Johan Rockström, but I was actually a member of his original authorship here, author's team, uh, which we published in Nature 2009. And of course, you have some of the planetary boundaries on climate change. You see, this inner circle, that's the safe operating space for humanity. If you stay there, then you can assume that you have more or less stable environmental conditions. If you go out of this safe space uh, here on climate change, we have already left it, when you will have to either transform yourself or nature will transform you. And today we know much more that is the update on planetary boundaries and we are much, much closer. Actually, we have transgressed six or seven thresholds already. So this is the situation. And this is either fixed and repaired in this century or human civilization with 10 billion people will collapse. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is not just a doom saying or a sort of apocalyptic babble. This is what we will be facing. So the next two decades, we either make sure that we stay or return with safe operating space all the economic activities we are now enjoying and using will not persist. So it's the critical time. So on climate change, this is the final scene of the Paris uh, COP21 uh, 2015, where, like this treaty on, on the high seas, which was struck just one week ago, which was a uh, decisive point in, in time, actually 2015. The agreement was, as a legally binding thing, that we will keep global warming to less than two degrees. And I will show you where we are right now. 
And based on the interventions by the small island states, for example, so many countries from the global south, the ambitious target was to even keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Unfortunately, we are now standing at 1.2 degrees. And as I said, with the next El Nino, we may already breach the 1.5 degrees uh, line here. So why is all this important? Well, a long time ago, actually, at a lecture I gave at the Oxford University in 2001, uh, I came up with this cartoon, which I've shown many times now. It's uh, the research behind it is going on and on. We have so many fascinating insights right now. This is about the so-called tipping elements in the Earth system. If the global climate system would be the human body, then we would say these are the vital organs of, of the global environment. Uh, the Amazon rainforest, the Great Barrier Reef, and in particular the big ice sheets, because they hold the equivalent of about 80 meter sea level rise. That means if they melt down, the sea levels will rise globally by 80 meters. And you can just think of what will happen to the Waikiki beach, for example, with an 80 meter sea level rise, but I will show you a map about it. So we are now doing a lot of research, the World Climate Council, IPCC and others, uh, when will these vital organs be tipped into either destruction or transformation at 1.5 degrees, at 2 degrees, at 3 degrees? And this is the ultimate justification for the 2 degrees target, actually. Yeah? But we want to avoid that these vital organs are being destroyed by global warming. And I'll give you just a few glimpses. For example, the Greenland ice sheet, if you look to the upper right side here, the Greenland ice sheet, which is holding the equivalent of 7 meter sea level rise, has lost 1 million tons of ice in 2019 per minute. So this is the greatest freshwater flux we have on Earth, actually. Now. And it keeps melting further. And here's a really interesting thing, it's just a, a glimpse of what we scientists do. Will the West Antarctic ice sheet, which you see here, this is this major peninsula sticking out from Antarctica, will it survive global warming? And we had 120,000 years ago, during the last warmer period within the glacial cycle, actually there's now compelling evidence that the West Antarctic ice sheet collapsed. Why? This is a fantastic paper which was just recently published. So I show you the citation. Actually, it's it's not even through peer review, it has been, it's a sneak preview which was uh, warranted and provided by the authors. You see here on the right hand corner, the lower corner, you see a small octopus. And this is an octopus species which is living around Antarctica. And by doing genetic analysis, reanalysis, one could show that 120,000 years ago there was a genetic exchange of octopuses living in the Ross Sea and in the Weddell Sea. That was only possible because the ice had disappeared at that time. So the West Antarctic ice sheet had collapsed and the warming was just 0.5 to 1 degree. So we can be actually sure that the West Antarctic ice sheet will collapse again with two degrees warming. But it's also a lesson of interdisciplinarity, you see. So biolo biologists, geneticists, physicists, environmentalists have worked together to produce this result here. It's absolutely fascinating in my view. So these are when will the various tipping elements be pushed into destruction, and many of the symbols you see here, in particular the orange circles mean, this will even happen below two degrees. Between two and four degrees, you will have all types of destruction. So this should just demonstrate to you that we are playing with the fate of this planet right now. 1.2 degrees warming already, 1.5 maybe in 10 years from now, when some of these tipping elements will already start to be activated. So, 
I skip this because of time, but I show you what will happen to the coastlines if the East Antarctic ice sheet will collapse, the West Antarctic anyway in Greenland. So this will be the new sort of coastline of the European continent. And you can, for example, look at the Krim, the Crimean. There will be no war about the Crimean anymore. It will be a small island in the future under this continent. And by the way, half of Britain will disappear. So this is the punishment for Brexit, I guess. <laughs> this was a joke, huh? <laughs> anyway, so I skip this and uh, just show you the forgotten environmental problem. The forgotten problem is ocean acidification. Huh? So on the one hand, if you have global warming, the sea level will rise, clearly. And you will have bleaching of corals. But at the same time, the acidification of the oceans, because if CO2 is extracted from the atmosphere by the water, then it becomes more acidic, of course. You turn sort of simple water, still water, into sparkling water. That is happening in the oceans right now because of the CO2 emissions. And that is destroying the reefs, the substance of the reefs. They get dissolved, actually by the acidity. Yeah? So that is the other problem which you cannot easily get rid of. So I skip this. I go to this paper because it's extremely important here. It is what is the future of the human niche? That means where are the conditions on Earth if we assume global warming going on where we can still live a comfortable life? Yeah? And you have to just so Currently, so panel A, the upper left corner, is if you are in the darker part of the world, including all of Europe more or less, you have very good living conditions. Huh? In the future, that's the lower left panel, 2070, you see how things are shifting. And actually, this is the difference. Everything in red on the right-hand side will become less suitable for life, actually. Yeah? And you see, it's all the global south, more or less. The only places on Earth which will, be, will become more suitable for tourism, for living, whatever, will be Russia and Canada, actually. Yeah? So Russia will be the prime tourist destination in the future. I don't think that this is a very good outlook. So we have to do everything to avoid that, of course. So I'll skip this heat island thing for Berlin. We can do all this. How many tropical nights? What about the water? Tourism, and in particular, that is one of my pet subjects, actually, because I was born in Bavaria, and at the age of three years, my parents put me on a pair of skis. It was wonderful to do skiing and all these things. This is gone, more or less, uh, in the middle ranges of the Alps, you cannot do skiing anymore most of the time, unless you use all these snow cannons and so on. But this is not a sustainable uh, sort of tourism industry. And uh, there's a very interesting report actually about the snow thieves. You might load it down, uh, telling you how this, this, the winter sport industry is kidding itself actually through their practices right now. Huh? So let's keep this and this and this. This is global warming, 1.2 degrees now, with the next El Nino probably pushed towards 1.4 degrees. So what are we going to do? Well, I think I have sufficiently depressed you right now, so I have to give you a little bit of hope. And actually, there are wonderful solutions we have in store. Huh? One of them is clearly we have to bring down emissions. By 2050, all the emissions have to go to zero. There is no other way. But at the same time, we will have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Without that, we cannot hold the 2 degrees line, let alone the 1.5 degrees. How can it be done? No? That is the big question. So here are the reports by the United Nations. And you see, we should actually reduce by 45% our emissions by 2030, that is in seven years from now, in order to hold the 1.5 degrees line. We will probably go beyond that. Huh? And now you can go talk about tourism. So there's a nice paper, Carbon Footprint of Global Tourism in Nature Climate Change. You see about 8% of the global emissions. 
But here is the stark truth. Here, just look at these two numbers. So, the United Nations World Tourism Organization calls for a 50% reduction in tourism emissions by 2030. That's the green arrow here. But the truth, the reality is that the tourism sector, which accounts again for 8% of the global emissions, has an estimated increase of 169% by 2050. So the two trends completely diverge, actually. And we have to be honest about this. This is the reality. Yeah? We need transparency about this. So we will need a great transformation in tourism industry. Yeah? And so I just skip all this. Uh, yeah. So let me go here. The solution. OK, this is the situation. And this is, you know, in every lecture, if you have gone to university, there's one slide or one intervention which makes all the difference whether this was a successful lecture for you or not. It is now. So keep attention. So this is on the horizontal line. This is timeline, of course. So we start in 1900 and we go to the year 2200. And this is global warming in black, as we have just witnessed over the last decades. You see the two lines, 1.5 degrees, we are now at 1.2. And this is business as usual. We would go into the realm of 3, 4, 5 degrees warming. And I think I have shown you that it would be a very bad idea to go into that domain. Huh? You would tip maybe all the tipping elements in the Earth system. Huh? And you would eventually have 80 meter sea level rise. So what can be done? We will definitely overshoot the 1.5 degrees, and we will also overshoot the 2 degrees. But here, all the important thing is to keep this overshoot as small as possible and as short as possible. And this can only be done by removing historical emissions from the atmosphere again. And there's a wonderful way to do it, actually, so-called negative emissions. The simple formula is reforesting the planet and retimber the cities, that means not building in the future infrastructures, hotels, airports, houses from concrete and steel. This will produce a tremendous amount of additional emissions, but rather from wood, from bamboo, from hemp, whatever, organic materials. Why? Because by photosynthesis, the environment, our forests, are turning our garbage, atmospheric garbage, into precious resources. And if you take this biomass and store it for hundreds of years in buildings, then you have actually net cleaned up the atmosphere. And I give you just a formula how much we need to do this. So we have done a paper on buildings as a global carbon sink, which has become extremely famous already now. And this is the formula, so to speak. We have to make our forests climate resilient anyway. We have lots of natural disasters now, storms, fires, pests, and so on. We have to rebuild our forests. We have to make them more diverse, of course, mixed, uh, broadleaf, uh, conifers. We have to have different age classes in order to withstand the new extremes of climate change. If you take out now a mature tree, you must not burn it, you must not turn it into paper. You have to turn it into timber, which you use in construction, actually, for at least 200 years. So the lifetime of a building built from biomass should be at least 200 years. Huh? So that's a very important information. When you replant, of course, immediately, even extinct the forest, we have one billion hectares of degraded land on this planet. We could use it for reforestation, of course. If you do that, the simple formula is we could go back to the pre-industrial atmosphere if we would only two, do two things only. We would have to plant and support additional 500 billion trees, which is 50 trees per human being. We have 10 billion people on Earth in 20 years from now, 50 trees. That would cost, at current prices, 500 euro, 
500 euro per human being. And we would have convert about 2 billion homes into a carbon sink by using organic material. This formula alone would restore the atmosphere. Now, of course, we know this will not happen the same way. But if we would only achieve 50 or 30 percent of that, it would actually keep us below 2 degrees or bend us back to 2 degrees. Okay, so that is the, my solution. That means in tourism, of course, you can very well contribute to that. This is a beautiful hotel in Amsterdam called the Jakarta Hotel. It's completely built from timber. And this is definitely something where you would feel at ease. Or we have in Heilbronn this wonderful pavilion, which was hosting events for 800 people. And it's now decomposed and moved to another site, to another buga. And you see, that's the other advantage. If you build something from concrete and steel, or you build it from timber, the weight is, for the timber building, only one-tenth, and you can decompose it. So, what I'm saying is, the climate crisis is a major, major challenge, probably the biggest challenge in the history of our civilization. But we have a nature-based solution. If we use renewable resources actually built and provided by the biosphere and use it in the right way, we can actually build ourselves out of the climate crisis. So that's my major message, and I'll just show you if I can. Yeah, this is just, I'm a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, and we did last year in Rome, in the Vatican actually, a conference on all this, and you see in the middle Ursula von der Leyen, who is fully supporting this approach here. There's the so-called new European powers. You have the German Federal Construction Minister, Clara Geiwitz, and we have a number of world-class architects and scientists. I think this transformation will help to save the world. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you very much. This was Prof. John Schellenhuber, ladies and gentlemen. So, in this presentation, nature-based solutions, something to keep in mind. We're, there's already some excellent projects happening in hospitality on nature-based solutions. We'll uh, touch on that a little bit later with the CEOs. Uh, there was one slide that you unfortunately had to skip, mm. but it was on personal carbon budget. And right. I know that's been creating a lot of waves, uh, also in the hospitality and tourism sector, this idea that every one of us would have a budget that gets depleted according to the choices we make uh, it, through transport, through energy, etc. And we know that in travel, you also quoted an article from Lenzen about the carbon, global carbon footprint. We know from this article that there is a relationship, a very strong relationship between the wealth of uh, individuals that increase proportionally with the carbon footprint that these people have. So is a carbon market for tourism a way forward? So to say we incentivize the use and demand of low carbon options and we uh, penalize the, hard carb the, the high carbon options. Is that a way forward? Uh, it would be a way forward. I don't know whether it will be ever implemented mm. due to political reasons, of course. But I think the most important thing is, if you are a tourist, I'm a tourist myself, I go to beautiful places, of course. Generally, I try to be, of course, climate friendly. But if you are a tourist, you should be at least honest about what you're doing. The personal carpet budget would mean we can calculate as scientists how much carbon can still be emitted by humanity as a whole, till the year 2050, when it has to be zero. And we can calculate if you allocate to every person on this planet the same amount, which sounds fair, so whether you are a billionaire or you are a farmer in Burkina Faso, you are entitled to the same amount. Huh? And it simply boils down to three tons right. of CO2 per annum in the next 27 years. Now, of course, some people will not even need it. In Burkina Faso, the per capita uh, emission is 100 kilo. In Qatar, it's 40 tons. And billionaires, of course, use thousands and thousands and thousands of tons. So the idea would be if the poor who don't need the CO2 would sell it, so to speak, to the rich, but you keep the balance. You always keep this overall amount when you could actually do a lot of good things for projects in the Global South, 
For a billionaire, it's not much. We would pay probably $100,000 per year for that, which is nothing for them. But you could create, for example, a water management system in Burkina Faso for that. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. But the most important thing is don't do finger pointing here, this industry, this coal mine and so on is responsible for global warming. No, we are all together mm -hmm. responsible. So if we would know this, uh, <laughs> at least we would be actually honest about our contribution and we would take responsibility for that individually because in the end it's us, you and me, and you all here who either destroy or save the planet. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Schellenhuber. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.